Hey everyone, welcome back to Digital Foundry Direct Weekly. This is indeed our weekly show where we discuss the latest gaming and technology news and there was certainly plenty of it this week. Um, we had uh, GDC 2023, uh, a massive slate of announcements from Epic Games with Unreal Engine 5 and Nvidia got a piece of the action too with its own GTC conference and its own range of announcements. Joining me to discuss all of this stuff and more got Elden Ring RT to talk about as well. Alex Battaglia. <laughs> yes, that's the only reason why I'm here, obviously. Elden Ring, <laughs> Elden a game Ring. that I'm notorious yeah. for loving. Your and favorite. Uh, ray tracing, yeah, of course. <laughs> and of course, John Dinnerman. Hey, good to see you back in the uh, the captain's chair there, Rich. And it's nice that you, <laughs> coming back from vacation, you brought all this news with you. How did you manage to get that through airport security? <laughs> it's, it's a mystery, right? <laughs> Okay, let's crack on with the first news story. Okay, so there are actually a bunch of announcements and some really cool technology on display at GDC and GTC. Uh, we need a we need another G asterisk C uh, to, to add to the, <laughs> to the lineup, I think. Um, but first of all, um, Alex, let's talk about Unreal Engine 5, State of Unreal. Uh, so much amazing stuff in there. Where do mm -hmm. we begin? I guess that... Um, foliage demo with the yeah. Rivian EV was pretty phenomenal, right? Yeah, I like that. So the one reason, when I was talking back, uh, when we they did, wasn't Lumen the Nan, it was Alley of the, uh, uh, Valley of the Ancients, Alley of the Ancients, uh, Valley of the Ancients, <laughs> yeah, that demo, they described how they'd um, blocked it out and made it back in the day, and it was a lot of kit bashing yeah. to make an entire, uh, like, valley, and if you think about it, that that is an interesting way to make something, but it's also a really bad way to make an open world, probably from a performance perspective, uh, because of the, like, the overlapping nanite layers, which are not conducive to using hardware RT, for example, but also um, because it requires a lot of manual work of each single thing being placed by an artist and then rotated and da 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 It's like, that's a lot of manual work. So that demo of the car driving through that little area had an area that was, you know, bespoke built as a part of it, but then it expanded out and into an area where they were using a lot of um, kind of prefabs that would be then procedurally placed in a deterministic way around the environment. And they showed off how it was placed and the editing tools that you have to kind of um, justify or delineate where things are going to be placed. And that is a really big deal because Unreal Engine 5 is going to be used for things like open world games. And their previous workflow for showing off how to populate open worlds wasn't actually that probably robust for a long-term project. Uh, I think this is a great step forward. Uh, other things that were shown off in the demo that looked good just from the general perspective was finally we were seeing beyond Fortnite, uh, their world position offset, Nanite support for foliage. Uh, foliage was previously not included as part of Nanite, and here we saw all of the foliage being done through Nanite. That part looked great. All of this stuff was fantastic, and you're right. I think being able to move to a procedural generation for some of this landscape stuff is really important because, uh, yeah, the that, that's actually one of the chief complaints I've heard when speaking with two developers working on Unreal Engine 5 games is they were basically trying to figure out how can we actually build out this world and that initial, that kit bashing method, uh, that was extremely time consuming and somewhat inefficient. I've built some of my own dioramas in that way and it is fun and it kind of works, but it feels like it would become overwhelming if you had like a very large environment with all these manually placed like uh, <laughs> meshes everywhere and it's like, oh, I need to move this one a little bit or tweak this. And I mean, it worked okay, but it, it wasn't the best solution, I think, long term for this. But the way they've done it here, it seems like I've always had this idea of like you build, you have your critical path, which is like your your prime game world, the carefully designed handcrafted level bits, and then Unreal Engine can help them essentially build out the rest of the environment in a way that looks visually pleasing and coherent with the rest of the level, right? Without spending as much time on it. Because I think fundamentally, and this Unreal is clearly moving moving further and further in this direction, it's about empowering the developers to build stuff more efficiently and faster. Because when you're working at this fidelity, uh, just the amount of time for each aspect of, of rendering is increased dramatically from, you know, artists building these meshes, you know, uh, placing them, lighting the scene, all of this stuff. 
like UE5 is at the point where it just does a lot of this stuff in a much more naturalistic way. I mean, that also feeds into the metahuman stuff that they talked about, right? It's just getting as much fidelity and data you can into the game world in the most efficient way possible. And they're doing a fantastic job there. Uh, in addition to uh, all the other visual features, you mentioned some of the things like the nanite foliage, but I really like that they actually showed off the fluid simulation in addition to the physical simulation of the car or the truck chassis as it drives through that little stream. And that's a, that's a nice thing to see. And there's a lot of potential there. I think we talked about that recently about more complex fluid simulations. I mean, yeah, we did. I don't think that's going to be something we'll just see in every game, mind you. But uh, <laughs> but the main thing that, that I was really thinking about with Unreal Engine 5 still is that we're still waiting for big games to ship on this, right? There's Fortnite, of course, but there's a lot of potential for what's to come. With the Elden Ring patch releasing, you once again see the typical line trotted out where people say, well, ray tracing isn't worth it. Like, why are, mm -hmm. why are we bothering with this? This isn't worth it. It's stupid. Like, that's what a lot of people <laughs> say. Like, And Alex, you see it all the time, right? Like, yeah, it's everywhere. A ton of comments. And yeah. I think people don't quite understand that once these Unreal Engine games start shipping with Lumen and all these features in, in action, everything's ray traced suddenly, right? <laughs> like, that's yeah. what this is. And that's what we're working towards. And it will ship on these consoles. And it's going to blow people's minds. They just don't know it yet. <laughs> yeah, right. it's absolutely. It, it's a bit yeah, shame. I'm reminded of uh, the early DX11 games, which was like grafted on tessellation that yes, ruins performance. Exactly. And then once the Xbox One came along, DX11 was essentially the standard. Your game had to be built on DX11, and suddenly we started to see, you know, really good stuff on DX11. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you're right. It's basically this idea that um, a bolt-on add-on, as it were, which is optional, is 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 basically a, a million miles away from an actual engine that's based around the principles of, of ray tracing. Although that said, you know, the console versions will be using a software path sure. for that for the most part. Well, I mean, the, the Matrix Awakens demos demonstrate hardware RT on those machines, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think we yeah. will see that. It'll in depend some, on the game. I think sure. it's going to depend on the game and their frame rate target, right? But I think the key here, though, as, as you mentioned, Rich, all, most of the stuff we've seen so far has been bolted on, right? And that's because games these days take so long to create. And the stuff that has released so far this generation is mostly games that have been in development uh, well before this sort of technology was available. And any time that you see ray tracing now, for the most part, not, not every time, it, it is basically just a bolt-on. And so it's not going to be nearly as effective as this complete comprehensive solution that Epic is offering with Unreal. And yeah, this presentation just further cemented my belief that this is going to be a big deal. Well, we saw the the I was going to say the lords of the fallen, but they've 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 lost the the. <laughs> the, the oh, gone. lords. Okay, yeah. I was thinking of lords Atlas of the fallen, fallen, but it's actually a, a different <laughs> game. Different, yeah. I'll be, I think the point is though that we're starting to see Unreal Engine five games that will filter through in twenty twenty three. But even so, those would have been primarily built with older versions of UE five. Yeah. So and they would be yeah, updated question, over time. So, you know, we have always got this kind of, I'd say, approximately, you know, 18 months to two years of lag. Right. Almost. I think uh, but, uh, um, one of the first Unreal Engine 5 titles we'll be seeing is Tekken 8, which is going to be right. interesting. Oh my God, okay. right. Right? Like that, that might be one of the first, if not the first third party UE5 games to ship. Yeah. And one thing with that game, we've kind of not seen what, what, technology from ue5 it's right. using we like there know. hasn't been obvious examples of lumen or nanite in exactly. that exactly um, so, so this, it'll be interesting it to may see just that. be an extension <laughs> of the ue4 feature set so we'll see <laughs> it may yeah. it just may um but another part of this demo i think that's really interesting and it ties it exactly into what john said about uh reducing time and workflows and empowering creators was the metahumans demo yep. that yep. uh showcased footage and the actress um from hellblade senua saga mm -hmm. uh, the second game for, uh from ninja theory there in that series and the cool thing about this is it's actually a lot i talked about it years ago now but um in star citizen they had a sim system that were from three lateral which metahuman is based on because uh, epic bought it and that game you could plug in your you can still do it plug in a webcam 
record your face and you get live mocap essentially on right. your face. And what they showed off here was a similar system to that where uh, the actress is standing in front of a cell phone or a cell phone, what year am I born? Um, <laughs> uh, standing in front of a smartphone <laughs> that's recording her face. And then they plug that into the editor and it runs an offline, like a quick uh, kind of like solver to see like where the face is moving. It's not doing it in real time. Uh, and then it plugs into a pre-made uh, model which was made and rigged with MetaHuman. And that showed off, I think, for that little tiny demo, really good quality yeah. in terms of the facial movement. Uh, obviously, lighting is one other thing, and the model itself had to be made beforehand to look so good. Um, but it looked really convincing. And um, yeah, that's exciting really stuff. Impressive. But, I would have loved to have seen her standing in front of a Nokia 6230. Alex. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it was just like <laughs> right behind her, massive, <laughs> chunky. Yeah, but you know, the, the kind of um, the whole um, idea, the ethos, I guess, of Unreal Engine Five is to bring these, you know, cutting edge features, but also to democratize it to all developers, which I think is a very, uh, you know, noble purpose. And it's kind of essential, really, that we have this kind of technology happening um, so nobody is is left behind. I'm just amazed by some of the stuff we saw. I mean, um, the initial demo with the uh, Rivian EV, it kind of addressed almost all of the issues that we've historically come up with uh, against um, Nanite specifically, which is amazing to see, right? I mean, it's... It's just phenomenal progress that's been made over the years. Uh, the MetaHuman stuff was also really, really impressive. And I think the Hellblade uh, demo that we saw there was uh, eye-opening, to say the least. And uh, I'm still seeing online, you know, how's this going to run on Xbox Series S? <laughs> well, it, it's actually consistent with uh, that original demonstration of the game way back in yes, 2019, it, even? It was a long time ago. It was pre-UE5, even. Yeah, it was so, the UE4 yeah. build, and they showed that same kind of facial expression. That's that's something that studio has always specialized in, I think. They've really focused on that. So it's great to see it used here. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got to talk about uh, UEFN, which is the oh my kind God. of... Um, well, what can you say? Fortnite is is becoming the metaverse. Fortnite and Roblox, I think we've <laughs> yeah. established. Established at this point. The, yeah. the, you know, the, it's quite amusing that... Um, you know, Mark Zuckerberg has invested something like thirty-eight <laughs> billion dollars into the metaverse, and it, yeah, sorry, Mark, it's actually happening in Fortnite and Roblox, <laughs> and, it, and it is happening there. The stuff we saw that demo that they put together from the Matrix Awakens team uh, was was just phenomenal. I thought, you know, the idea that this is a running in Fortnite that you have this ability to create to roll it out onto all platforms not just democratizing this technology for game developers, but actually for the end user. Mm -hmm. Astonishing stuff, right, Alex? Yeah, I, I was excited for this because it reminded me of a lot of other tech I've seen in games before. You mentioned it just as we were uh, leading up to talking about this, Rich, that it reminded me of live multi-edit and CryEngine back in the day where yes. you could have the PC build running and then you'd hit a button and it would just show the exact same thing on the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360, which were plugged yeah. in. And it the, would have been great for our platform comparisons back in the day. Oh, it would have been so nice. But <laughs> we got that here. We got the ability to essentially host a server where someone is in the UEFN editor there and they are plugging in content um, doing the scripting and uh, dragging and dropping all these things. Maybe even seems like the animation could also be set up while people are in the server as well too. And they can see it and then comment back to you about how it's running and looking at the same time. It's it's like Halo's Forge or Gary's Mod. See, that reminds except, me, that you know, this is specifically this. what my son has been doing in Roblox a lot. He gets online mm -hmm. with his friends and they are building structures, maps, games, all kinds of stuff together uh, connected online and kids seem to love this stuff where you just, you learning to build things to show to your friends and your friends are connected to the same server. And to him, it's just pure fun. But what I see is like, it's actually teaching them how to make stuff, right? They're, they're learning skills and it's all born out of wanting to do fun things with your friends. And it's a lot easier to get those results very quickly in things like this. And that seems to be what they're pushing here in Fortnite. You know, like I remember back in the day building maps for Doom and Duke Nukem 3D, right? There was no instant gratification there. Like you could you could pretty easily get something going, but like actually getting something that you would want to play with, it was really time consuming and difficult, right? Uh, this is like next level stuff. And it is doing it with this fidelity and this quality and this amount of flexibility is, is pretty darn impressive. 
and I'm curious to see where it leads for future creators as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, let's take a quick question from a supporter from Amber Tack. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm really, really yeah, sorry. I wouldn't know where to start. <laughs> Amber Takum Salamat. Oh, so sorry. Uh, hello, DF <laughs> exclamation point. With <laughs> Epic and UE5 constantly making the news for their groundbreaking tech, how do you expect AAA studios like Rockstar, Naughty Dog, U Ubisoft, etc., to keep up with Epic and UE5 while sticking to their in-house engines? It's an interesting mm. discussion point, right, John? Because, yeah. you know, a lot of them aren't, you know, sticking with their uh, specific engines. And I remember back in the day we were talking about um, how the next Witcher game is going to be on Unreal Engine 5, and we were slightly mm. concerned about that. But then you look at that demo that they put out uh, with the, all of the foliage yeah. in there, and you think, okay, yeah, I can see possibly why they do that. But it, they're not going to be the only engine in no. town. I, so w what I actually see happening here is that this is going to uh, influence where the talent goes, because there are going to be engineers, and I know many of them, that don't want to do Unreal Engine based work. They want to build their own technology. That's what they that's what they enjoy doing and that's what they want to do. And those are the people that will go to studios like id Software, Naughty Dog and the like, or Insomniac, any of them, and they will do their good work there. So I think you'll pull a lot of the more talented engineers that want to build their own technology to all these types of studios. And then the rest will just, you know, and then you'll have a and I'm, I'm not saying in a negative way. I mean, like you'll have people that just want to work in Unreal. That's their specialty, which is difficult enough, of course. But and then they will gravitate towards studios that have switched to Unreal. So you're going to end up with this two split pools. You have the people that want to make new stuff and then you have the people that are experts in Unreal. And I'm very curious to see how that goes going forward. Right. Because id Software ain't switching to Unreal Engine, okay? That ain't happening. <laughs> just gonna say it. <laughs> that would be. Yeah, I. But what about what about, for example, Ubisoft with uh, Assassin's Creed? So Anvil Next has been. There Ubisoft for is in a really interesting situation because they're one of the few large publishers that actually has multiple advanced engine technologies split between multiple games. Right? They have uh, Snowdrop. They've got Anvil. They've got Dunia. They have a UB art framework, probably something else. And all their studios are using these different technologies to build different types of games. Um, I, it's a large enough company where I'd assume they have the, the, the money to throw around to hire up the, the engineering staff that they need. I think the big problem is actually for smaller developers that utilize their own in-house technology. The ones that can't pay that premium to keep the engineering talent employed, uh, those those places might struggle to continue to utilize their own in-house technology just because mm -hmm. maintaining an engine and also enhancing it and updating it with new features is extremely difficult and finding the people to do it is uh, even more so. Uh, and I think in those cases, they just have no choice but to just uh, accept the inevitability. Uh, Unreal Engine has basically become the Borg at this point yeah. so uh, for small studios uh, it is it's very i mean does if you're trying make, to hire does, people it's hard so yeah. does, does yeah. that make tim sweeney the borg king the, is it like cutest too I don't know. <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> cutest <laughs> Oh, oh, wow. Yeah. Um, so something that wasn't in the state of Unreal, um, but yeah. is highly important, is that, uh, well, there, there have been further strides made to address hashtag stutter struggle, right, Alex? Yeah, so mm. as part of 5.2, which is there, um, there's been an update to the PSO caching and pre-caching system uh, that we saw rolled out with 5.1 and then also implemented in a way in Fortnite where we could see the progress being made, but it was still not what we want for the fin for the final product. Basically, we wanted to see like zero shader compilation stutter on PC. That's the end goal here. And uh, as a part of 5.2, and I'm presuming there's going to be work continuing on this into 5.3 as well, based on the roadmap, uh, you have now the ability to they've expanded the pre um the offline pre-caching process so it's easier now to s get more uh shaders uh in your qa tests kind of uh when you're running through the game and collecting shaders for the pre-compilation step if you want to use that step but uh, another big part of this was the automatic shader compilation 
that is happening in the background on threads as the game is running, which we saw in 5.1 and in Fortnite, but it wasn't doing a good enough job. Well, now it's better at parsing and saying which shaders are actually relevant. UE is an engine that is built in a way where there's a lot of artist freedom and there's just tons of shaders created all the time. And some of them are almost never used or ever even seen by the player, or, you know, it's just an engine with tons of shader permutation, unfortunately, with the way it was built. And most projects use it as well, too. Well, Alex, you, you, say un filtering those. you say unfortunately, yeah. but that is actually a selling point of Unreal. <laughs> it, right? it is, but it's not necessarily <laughs> a selling point if you're no. making a PC game. No, it's uh, not. In terms of like, oh, we have to wait half an hour for all the shaders <laughs> compile, or we have incessant shader compilation stutter. So these are things that it's the you know, the project makers had to keep in their heads if they wanted to make a successful PC game. So many failed on that, as we've seen. Uh, and this automatic filtering now and parsing of more relevant shaders is going to presumably, we'll have to wait till we see final products that are using UE 5.2, hopefully eliminate some of these issues. Another thing that I liked seeing here, but I don't think it's turned on by default, is the ability for a shader to be skipped and only shown on screen after it has been background compiled. So that would prevent things like um, a new character showing up in the distance and you still can't even barely see them, but then it causes shader compilation stutter. Here, the character would maybe arrive one or two frames later, the length of the shader compilation stutter essentially, and then show up on screen. It would lead to technically more closer pop-in for objects, or maybe if a camera cut and they didn't do a pre-compilation step, it could lead to like one frame later, the like material shows up in a proper way, but it would be way worth it, I think, in terms of not having stutter, which I find more distracting than an object showing up in the distance a little bit later. Okay, um, that's fair enough. So those are things I want to see, and I want to see games using this soon. Yeah, I just suddenly had a vi vision of you sort of hijacking the state of Unreal. <laughs> Why like, on stage? Yeah, it's to, like uh, throwing paint this. on the stage or something. To be like shader cop hashtag stutter struggle. Like the last generation. Sorry to kind of. Um... <laughs> that would be amazing. Or like a scripted intervention to talk about this stuff. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Um, let's move on to some of the stuff from Nvidia GTC, and mm -hmm. there's quite a lot going on here. I mean, we had the announcement, a, a release date for um, Cyberpunk 2077 RT Overdrive which is i think ah oh, wow this this is going to be like almost like a sea change right the concept of a triple a title and not just any triple a title actually having path traced lighting um this is kind of like one of the things where we don't kind of believe it until we see it right alex i mean it's 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 that ambitious it is very ambitious because you know it's a huge open world game with tons of moving parts and really far draw distances and these are things usually where we see ray tracing uh having limitations like in terms of lots of objects the cpu load is like ah oh. and then <laughs> the draw distance you know spider-man on ps5 to make things look you know draw further into this and the ray tracing they heavily reduce the quality of the ray tracing stuff uh, but in this game it's going to be path race so if you reduce that quality it'll be really obvious so here we're going to be seeing this like it's it's going to be really heavy i already know it's going to be <laughs> really really heavy um i imagine that ada lovelace series of cards are going to be the only way you're going to really maybe want to play this but we'll see obviously when we get our hands on and we do some testing I'm very excited well, about that. Well, frame generation is going to be key, I think. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's gonna it's gonna elevate the DLSS two performance that's already there into something that you'd want to actually be using for a single player game. Um, maybe the 30 FPS is also some way people could experience it. I mean, some people play these games at 30 FPS. That's also cool. Uh, but the reason why this that exists in the first place is because, as a part of this, um, Nvidia is releasing two things. Uh, uh, in a more easily integratable form into game engines like we see now in Red Engine 2, powering Cyberpunk 2077, that is their RTX Path Tracing and um, DLSS 3. RTX Path Tracing is essentially the system and the, the rendering that they use for 
um, Cyberpunk 2077's overdrive mode where RTX DI handles all the direct lighting. And then there's a like a souped up form of RTX GI uh, that is doing the indirect lighting in the scene. And it could actually be different depending upon the game. I think it's going to have multiple modes uh, based the way the, the way it sounds. And it's going to be updated over time to use things like their like their neural denoising and who knows what. Uh, that's really cool because I like that idea. And Rich has talked about in the past where PCs are going to keep advancing and Ada Lovelace RTX 4090 is already showing that it's just like it's really outpaced like the the performance of something like a PS5 GPU, especially in ray tracing. And this is good for people that have those GPUs because technically a developer could use this plugin and the ability to path trace the lighting in the game to give people with really high end GPUs that are going to exist today or two years in the future, the ability to have like ultra high end modes in their games where, oh yeah, the lighting's now all path traced actually. And that's your special mode for people in the future using your game. How many people will use this? I don't know. Um, it's going to be part of UE5 at some point, really obviously as a plugin. And, you know, it's already going to be there in Cyber 2070. I just hope we see more of it. And then, of course, the other part of the technology that makes this possible on current generation hardware is something like DLSS 3, which is now going to be part of Streamline as of announced at GDC and GTC. And that is really good because I think DLSS 3 is a really compelling technology and it's just gotten better recently and it's going to get better in the future. And now it is just as pluggable into games as DLSS 2 was if you use Streamline. Um, that is, of course, hinging on the fact that you use Streamline. And Streamline currently supports Intel uh, XESS and AM, uh, NVIDIA's DLSS 2 and 3, but it doesn't support AMD because AMD doesn't want to support it. So how many developers use it? Once again, I'm not sure, uh, but I hope based upon the current like trajectory of things, there's a lot of games that have DLSS 3 already. I hope that it just keeps broadening this technology out I, to be in more right. I also like uh, they, they have a little piece on the on here talking about the Caustics branch of Unreal Engine, showcasing mm -hmm. ray trace depth of field and Caustics on this pair of dice. And it seems <laughs> like cool. that I hadn't thought about ray trace depth of field as much, but simulating the optics of an actual camera lens that solves a lot of the issues with transparent edges that you see with current depth of field implementations still today. And again, I, I'm sure people, you know, whatever, but <laughs> yeah. I, I think, I think it looks really, really cool. Uh, I liked it a lot. It, it, it's cool stuff. They had to find a way to make their NVIDIA branch compelling again with UE5 because RTX GI is somewhat superseded by Lumen. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, they already have a GI system. Why do we need a different GI system? Uh, so they need to make it compelling in another way. And things like caustic, depth of field, maybe even motion blur, uh, oh, things yeah. that are not done in real time in UE5 right now, but might be in the future. Uh, let's take a, a question from Automata or other Automata. It's, uh, it's the American trailer for Neo Automata uh, pronounces it. Uh, hey, DF team. I was wondering how everyone is feeling about the RT overdrive mode for Cyberpunk. I think everyone's excited for how much of a technological leap it's going to be over virtually every other AAA game. But I worry that many people online have unrealist, unrealistic expectations for what hardware it can run on. After all, a 4090 at 4K was getting frame rates in the 20s. That was before frame generation, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there you have DLSS plus uh, frame gen for a solid 100 FPS experience. But I see plenty of 30 series owners online excited for the mode when I have my doubts it will have great performance on anything other than the existing 40 series cards and future GPUs. I think on the one hand, that's kind of the point, um, which is to basically exercise this new technology, right? Mm -hmm. And to set the, the template for, you know, PCs of the future, which is which are going to have far more horsepower. But at the same time, if you're getting 100 frames per second on a 4090 at 4K, that does suggest some level of scalability, I think. I'm excited to see yeah. this simply because it's something that's been lacking from the PC space for a while. Games that actually push the envelope and require a lot from the hardware. I mean, that's the whole thing that Crisis and many things before that were built on, right? Showcasing yeah. new visual features that most people can't run very well, at least. <laughs> uh, but it's important for the future of graphics. And I think this yeah. kind of thing is, is fantastic to see for that very reason. But it's true. I suspect that a lot of people are going to have issues with performance on this, similar to uh, uh, the Portal RTX release. But, I mean, 
it does seem like 30 series cards should be able to at least handle it at somewhat lower but still playable frame rates i mean i guess yeah, i guess we don't I think, know for sure but yeah. well looking looking at the uh, testing we did back in the day on dlss3 when we had it first um <laughs> it's fair to say that a, a lion's share of the performance gain came from dlss2 um because when you're doing rt at 4k native resolution the workload there is just astonishingly high yeah to begin with and so it's basically whittling it down via dlss upscaling from 1080p or whatever actually claws back a huge amount of performance i wouldn't really be too concerned about the fact that native 4k on a 4090 is 20 is in the 20s no um, simply because of the scalable nature of rt when you lower resolutions but you have any thoughts on this one alex um yeah i think uh, it's fine, just like Crisis was back in the day. If you have a card, <laughs> if you have a card that can't run it really, really well, maybe just load up the mode and see what it looks like visually, and enjoy that just from a visual perspective, and then turn down the settings. I also think it's going to be scalable. Maybe Overdrive mode will also have like a certain like kind of. I think it's going to be like a toggle based upon what I un understand from reading about it. I think it's going to be a toggle, and then you'll have performance presets for it. Like there'll be a like a high an ultra and then maybe a psycho setting uh for that it's not just going to be everything's path traced with a certain amount of race per pixel and that's all you have to live with i think that's what's going away it's work so maybe there will be scaling here also beyond things like dlss we'll see real quick uh side tangent though uh nvidia was very successful with the marketing of ray tracing under their rtx brand and I almost yes. wonder if this has had a negative impact on on the impression that people have about ray tracing, because we constantly see people referring to ray tracing as RTX, right? Which is a brand Still. name that's not actually, that doesn't refer to ray tracing itself. And because of that association and knowing the whole team red, team green kind of like warring that goes on, I do feel like there's a certain subset of people that dismiss ray tracing in general just because of this nvidia association which is not good for the future of graphics right like it's a very strange thing but it's extremely observable i think i just saw another one today uh that alex i think you saw as well it's just like I saw again it. i commented <laughs> rtx is a brand ray tracing rt is is a technology <laughs> yikes yeah. so it is funny just imagine if uh nvidia uh you know, just imagine if uh, physically based materials was an Nvidia exclusive oh, yeah. technology. PBR it's kind X. of similar to that, right? <laughs> or, or you know, to extend it still further, what if DX13 was uh, Nvidia only? It's oh, a similar principle, right? Yeah. It's basically um, it's the direction of travel. You know, um, all of these new features, and it's just simply the case that one vendor got there first, and it's the vendor that's investing billions of dollars, literally billions of dollars, into research and development. Um, and that's why things are as they are. But yeah, I do wonder whether the, the, the whole sort of um, RTX thing has, I wouldn't say backfired, because, you know, as, as what we are left with is the fact that um, AMD are in sort of perpetual catch-up mode, uh, even though it is the same features, right? And it is the same API, you know. I think a lot of people were quite surprised when... Um, uh, the RX 6000 line appeared and, you know, all of those previously NVIDIA exclusive modes just kind of worked on an AMD GPU, even if they weren't especially performant, they worked because yep. it's based on, you know, it's based on a unified standard yeah. at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah. uh, anything more to talk about on this before we wrap up the GTC, GDC? GTC. Oh, yeah, just one last thing is that there was a lot of other talks at GDC that... <laughs> that there's no way I could really, I haven't seen them even. No, uh, neither. So, so um, don't expect me to talk about them for a bit until there's more uh, footage released from GDC and or the papers themselves. The, the yeah, there's a lot of amazing stuff. You know, the Horizon yeah. talks were packed. Exactly. Uh, yes, there's, there's, a, there's a lot to, to, to sort of um, uh, absorb there, but it's also the case that some of these talks don't appear online for like a month. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, we will be chasing those, though, obviously. Um, let's move on to the next news topic, finally. 
Uh, but before we do, Alex, I just wanted to apologize for snickering during your uh, oh, did you snicker? talk there. Well, oh, it's yeah? just because I was looking at the docket here and uh, <laughs> the headline, uh, DF Direct Weekly number 104, has been oh, yeah. augmented with a subtitle, Daddy's Back. <laughs> Daddy. I was on holiday, I am back. But uh, yeah, okay, let's move on. <laughs> let's go. Um, Elden Ring Ray Tracing kind of just dropped out of nowhere. We had some sort of behind the scenes knowledge that it was happening, um, but it just kind of appeared. Um, and mm. well, it's it's from software. There's We always go into this with a certain level of um, expectation management, shall we say. Um, <laughs> John, what's, what's the story here? Oh boy. It's, I, I think I made a point of this. This is the implementation of ray tracing that gives ray tracing a bad name. Because while the benefits are visible and welcome, I would say, um, it's not a it's not a game changer. It doesn't dramatically transform the visuals in this game. And more importantly, it doesn't really help with the the most serious issue, which is which remains performance, right? So they're introducing this on consoles where performance is already a struggle. There's no proper 30 FPS cap even if you wanted to use this. And so it's basically enable this light ray tracing feature and receive fewer frames that's basically what they're asking to me mm -hmm. it feels like a little bit of a waste of time in that sense i mean i guess it's nice on the pc if you have access to it there but uh, uh it's, just, it's pretty much like rtao stuff right like in some shadows but not like nothing on the interiors so like if you want f nicer looking foliage shading which is cool i guess it's you get that but uh it's it seems like it's not it doesn't offer much of a huge visual benefit versus the performance loss, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. It is yeah. somewhat mystifying as to why it, why it's happened. I mean, there were announcements early on that it was going to support ray tracing. It's kind of turned it's, up a year later. It's, this is it's <laughs> basically like the Halo Infinite situation, right? It is it's very similar. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's like you know, like I just want to echo John uh, because we look at the PC version. And we look at all the things that let's just leave even performance out of the the, the situ, like the discussion right now. All the other issues with the PC version, it doesn't support ultra wide. It doesn't support variable frame rate. These are things that are just like I was. They were part of my basic tenets that I said: stop making lousy PC ports, add in variable frame rate to your games, um, and then you can add in the performance issues as well. And then you see like they, there's a year of to implement this, which it's, it doesn't even ship with FSR 1, 2, or DLSS, so it kind of will not be usable on many PCs for people that want to use it in terms of the mid-range. Uh, it's just like a, it's just, there's so many issues with it. And then I just, on the console side, the it does seem like the performance hit is significant enough to where I, it's really, I would struggle to understand why you would want to turn it on. Um, I don't know. It's kind of like they're missing the point of what ray chasing should do to a title at this point. It feels like a waste of engineering time. It does. Like they should have they really should have taken that time and focused it elsewhere. I think, and mm -hmm. this is not yeah. the way. What would you have liked to see? I guess um, ray trace global illumination would have been the Huge. must have for this kind of game. That would have been cool, I, 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 but out of just like more shadow maps, you take out a torch in this game and there's no shadows from it. <laughs> like the, the it's Dark Souls 2's pre-release version showed that off and they don't have it in Elden Ring. Uh, it's really weird and m almost none of the almost none of the indoor lights are shadow casting. See, uh, man, I I uh, played that like... build of of Dark Souls 2 by the way back at uh Gamescom yeah. that year. They actually had it running on a PS triple with all the shadow casting lights. It was awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they still haven't reached that level of fidelity, weirdly enough, uh, in terms of that, those things. It feels like there's other things than ray tracing which would improve the visual quality of this game and the performance qual like the performance I, aspects before even ray tracing should have been considered. I think that's the key, Alex. Is like they haven't even explored everything that rasterization can offer, right? Like there are so many other things they could improve uh, that would be welcome, but also really just performance. Like I, like you said on PC, they should be using. FSR2 or DLSS uh, on consoles, they should have perhaps explored a D or FSR2 as well, right? Mm -hmm. Some some way, because we know the game is resolution sensitive because the resolution mode has a significant <laughs> impact on performance on those consoles, right? So FSR2 seems like a no-brainer to me in terms of something to attempt and see how it works. 
Uh, because yeah, the, the game's just not performing enough still, uh, and that that's a bummer. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, um, Tom is actually looking at this now, so we are going to get some idea of the performance hit and what these features can actually do. But it is to the point where, um, in general gameplay, it's very difficult to, to tell the difference. A lot of people, I mean, <laughs> the thing that kind of amused me was uh, a lot of people would have seen no difference at all because you actually need to oh, yeah. uh, go back to the main menu and reload your game <laughs> to actually get the main tracing effect to be visible. So can you imagine people just sort of, you know, naively switching between ray tracing on and off and thinking... I, I don't see it. Yeah, that's, 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 a, that's a failure of user interface design. A really big failure, <laughs> right? actually. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, there's there's so much that could have been improved in that year of development time, but just hasn't happened. And this does feel like the wrong use of resources, almost. Oh, these guys. Yeah. They make such amazing <laughs> games. This game is so, so, so good. But Yeah, man. astonishing, really. Yeah, but... There it is. I mean, it's it's been the kind of habitual weakness of, of the From Software titles that there have been these technical issues. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it continues. I think there's not really too much to, to say further on this, but we'll let Tom go deeper on this yeah. and see what he comes go up with. Go deep on him, Tom. Go, go deeper. Enhance. <laughs> Enhance. You played rather style enhancing there to actually <laughs> see the difference. Um, but let's move on to the next news topic. Okay, so yeah, this is going to be um, the latest in a long line of whinges that we've had about um, digital distribution of games. Um, so earlier this week, there was the announcement that... Um, Mirror's Edge and a bunch of really good Battlefield games were going to be delisted from all digital stores. Um, It turned out that there was a miscommunication in the announcement, so Mirror's Edge isn't being delisted um, because there were no online features to speak of, apart from, I think, a a leaderboard, which servers had already been deprecated on that. But the point is that a bunch of really impressive Battlefield games from like the seventh generation of consoles and PC, well, they're just not going to be supported any further oh, um, awful. bad company is for many the highlight of the battlefield genre mm-hmm. that's going to be disappear- disappearing it's not great is it alex no there's a lot of things here that are really bad about it because um well these games technically are still online playable as far as i understand um like Battle- battlefield bad company 2 should be i know that for sure and Delisting these games means we don't have access to them in the future. Uh, you should still be able to download them if you own them. Uh, if I mm. understand that correctly, that would be really weird if they took that away. But they were also like different Battlefield games. Battlefield Bad Company 1, although console exclusive, was a really interesting revitalization of the series after 2142, where it was seeing like, okay, how do we take this in a different direction? It was this like new destruction route. Um, and slightly more arcadey gameplay in that aspect. But it was really interesting. They had a really neat single-player campaign there. Battlefield Bad Company 2 also has a single-player campaign. And delisting things with single-player campaigns to me is just, like, really messed up. Like, I don't see the purpose of it. Just have it so when someone clicks the server browser button, it just doesn't show anything anymore. There's no master server anymore or something. It doesn't show up any servers anymore. Tons of games have done that in the past. Whatever. Uh, but why do you list games that people could buy and still enjoy? I, I don't see any reason to do this at mm. all. None. I mean... John, you can't be happy about this. No. It's, this seems like a Jim Ryan move, actually. Why would you <laughs> want to play these old games? Uh, <laughs> okay. Right. It, no, it, this, is, this is a serious... I mean, this remains a problem. It's a... It continues exactly as uh, I've been saying for years. Just these companies, they're not looking at this necessarily from the perspective of uh, people, of the consumer, I feel. It's just like, well, this is... Actually, you know what? I I, I can't even come up with a good reason. <laughs> like, thinking about it, it's like... I was thinking, <laughs> like, oh, yeah, the online stuff. was like, oh, the campaigns are good. And, like, why would they just want to not sell a product that is good? <laughs> right like it's like people like this product uh i, I why like it doesn't make sense like how much how much of their server resources is this actually eating up like you wonder like it can't be that much like they need to keep it available for download anyway for those that did purchase it right so yeah, why right. not simply accept additional purchases and allow people to get in on that 
Right. It's, it's, is there any way they could have, um, I mean, if the servers are the issue, is there any way they could have essentially open sourced the server side technology? Well, that, that, yes. that would require additional work. <laughs> I'm right. okay. interested yeah. in that right now. There needs to it's be a way. Annoying. There needs to be a way to to do this without having an impact on like company time. Basically, like what's the fastest way to do this without delisting it? Uh, we need a solution there, but I think it's just going to continue to happen, and we're we're marching steadily towards this digital future where games are disposable and can be mm. removed and on a whim. Thankfully, uh, in the case of Bad Company One and Two. And thankfully, it's not removed, but Mirror's Edge as well. There are disc versions of these games, so you can still experience them somehow. You can still go out so, and purchase those discs. I'm pretty sure Battlefield 1943, though, is not, it is not. disc purchable. Does it that even have a campaign? Online. Does that have a campaign, though? I it don't has, think it does, does it? I think it has bots, though. Oh. So, like, right. I, yeah, yeah, I, you sure, know, leave, I think, it, leave it live, then. So it's it's like ah, like I don't I don't understand like why Battlefield 1943 was also really interesting. Because I think that was console exclusive as well, too. So there's no PC version of that, and they're delisting it. There's no, like, it's going to be stuck on boxes that are eventually going to die. Um, and that sucks. <laughs> that sucks really hardcore. Alex, the triple yeah. will never die. Come on now. That's true. It's an, yeah. <laughs> Eternal. The triple lives forever. forever. Are we sure that 43 wasn't available on... Uh, Disc. On, oh, you're, I think you're right, Alex. I'm doing some Googling here. Yeah, I, I remember back in the day there was a lot of upset because Battlefield 1942 was a PC-only game and it was right. what made the series big. And then 43 was 360 and then PS3, I think, maybe a little later. I can't recall. But it was it was it never came to PC, which was a shock. According to uh, Bing, to they came out on basically the same day. One day apart. Yeah, they did. One day apart. <laughs> yeah. So I was somehow magically correct there. Um, <laughs> uh, that is great. But yeah, that is one that was a, such a shame back in the day. And they eventually brought out uh, Battlefield Bad Company to Vietnam, which was a revitalization of Battlefield Vietnam. But that was on PC. But they never brought Battlefield 1943 to PC, which was mm. ugh, which was such a big deal. It is backwards compatible on Xbox One, though. Oh, yeah. that's good for those who bought it. <laughs> okay, not, not for you as a PC gamer. No, not at all. No, it's not good at all. <laughs> I don't think we've got anything more to say about this except except to say it's a bit of a shame, almost akin to cultural vandalism, considering that is a very important franchise, right? But there we go. Um, let's move on to the next used topic. So this one is actually quite positive, I think. There has been reaction from... Um, developer Arcane, that its upcoming um, shooter Redfall is hopefully going to lose its always online component that's required for even for single player campaign gameplay. Uh, John, do you want to pick up the story here? Yeah, so uh, Redfall, well, there's actually a couple things with Redfall this week, but the main thing is that in the past it was reported that this is an online only game, despite offering a single player component. Uh, and of course, you know, like anything, I was not happy about that. Many others were not happy as well. Uh, but Harvey Smith being the the wonderful guy that he is, uh, he's and I, I love the interviews out there with him right now. He, he's done so much great stuff. But they are actually looking into removing the requirement for solo players. They're taking it seriously. This is actually one of the first times I can recall a game director or anyone higher up at a studio actually acknowledging the outcry over this sort of issue and not only addressing it, but looking to solve it as well, right? Like it's clear they had a purpose behind the initial online thing. They wanted to uh, basically monitor players in a sense to understand how they were playing and sort of solve potential issues via patches, you know, basically recording metrics of various playthroughs. But they are now looking into um, a way to ship the game without requiring an online connection. And my hat is off to them for that uh, because that's that's great. That's extremely cool. There was also the stuff I mean, out there this week about the whole PS5 build stuff, which, duh, of course, that existed at some point. But it just cemented in my mind that Harvey Smith, like, I think it's fantastic that he's out there just able to speak somewhat frankly rather than filtering everything through extreme PR. Like, I'm sure there's still a PR layer there, but he's very open and honest. And I think this is the type of behavior we should reward and acknowledge, right? Yeah. It's it's, it's great, great to see. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Any thoughts on that, Alex? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to see that gone because 
I don't imagine myself playing this game necessarily in oh, multiplayer unless oh, the yeah. unless it's more co op like yeah. like the co op stuff. Maybe I'll be interested in. Alex, it, I was thinking but actually I don't need on, to. on the co op stuff. What if you and I did a video? Like, Maybe be... we should do it like we did with uh, Resi Four. Well, we'd actually be I online, take a version. right? Oh my! Yeah, we could we'd be online together online at the same time. That'd, That'd be actually fun. <laughs> That'd be fun. I'm making of a video a right here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, okay, well, let's just uh, crack on and move on to the next news topic. There's a ton of stuff to go through here. Uh, so this one is quite interesting, especially, I guess, for you, John, because you've got a pretty good relationship with these guys. Night Dive Studios, oh, yeah. the masters of the retro remaster, have been acquired by none other than Atari. And I think uh, supporter Todd Weitzel sums up our sort of uh, potential concerns here and concerns of the fan base. Uh, Atari and Night Dive, optimistic or pessimistic? Are you optimistic, John, or are you pessimistic? I am fairly optimistic, I would say, uh, because fundamentally the Atari that, that has purchased them or acquired them is not the Atari of old. It is the Atari that supported projects such as Atari 50. Uh, it's a company that seems to be interested in the legacy of their games and, and games in general. Um, and, you know, it, it's a positive thing from that perspective. They were interested in not just in the IP, but actually in the technology, like the Kex engine. Uh, and I think that's really, really crucial here. And this sort of like financial support could potentially, if it goes well, uh, allow them to take on larger scale projects, maybe beef up the staff even more. Uh, it could also potentially solve issues with licensing because I think there was the whole, like the blood, they, they remastered blood, right? But it's a PC only release. And, you know, once you get the, the might of a larger company behind you, perhaps they could actually find a way to solve those licensing issues and release yes. the game on other platforms, for instance. That would be great. Um, so all of this stuff, to me, seems on the surface that it should be a fairly positive thing. And Atari, you know, in this current state, they're not so big. They're not a mega lith corporation here, right? We're not talking like NetEase or, or anything else like that, or Microsoft or Embracer or any of them. This is a different sort of situation. And as a result, uh, I am, I will remain positive unless we're given a reason to not remain positive, but yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> it remains to be seen, okay. but yeah. Thoughts, Alex? Um, I think one other thing that the Atari will enable them is like not just like the licensing of like previously made games and then getting them to other platforms, but also there's more financial backing and lawyer backing to acquire other new licenses for games that could desperately use the night dive treatment. Uh, we've talked about like <laughs> there's a lot of games that we've talked that we think night dive should make new versions of and i think this atari backing them could make that more of a possibility in the future absolutely yeah. i mean they, they really uh, are one of the best in the business when it comes to remastering classic games especially from the pc era the kex engine the whole framework around that uh the team is extremely dedicated and very talented at this stuff and they specifically deliver versions of games that offer all the quality of life improvements that you would want from a modern release while still remaining completely true to that original vision and that's uh that's very difficult to find these days i will say it is quite interesting though that night dive specialize in remasters of games that are kind of beyond the golden era of atari that is it's more in, in the sort of 90s pc era where they've really thrived with their with their remasters. yeah i I, th I think modern atari is not just concerned with old atari stuff right? <laughs> like, I, I think yeah. it's moved on from that Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we'll be watching that with great interest. Uh, let's move on to the final news topic. Oh. <laughs> this one is uh, it's just basically a PSA, which is to say earlier in the week, Tom put out a video of the Outer Worlds Spacers edition. Spacers um, Choice. Spacers Choice, yeah. <laughs> um, the concept of choice with that remaster is quite an interesting notion. I think. <laughs> Actually, um, given what Spacer's Choice represents within that game, this feels like a fitting name somehow. Actually, it is. Yeah, <laughs> it's lore so, appropriate. <laughs> I mean, you know, basically the game launched in a bit of a state, and um, a patch 1.1 came out on PlayStation, which addressed some issues, but actually seemed to make things worse in others. Um, I'm just going to go through. I mean, Tom actually put together a pretty decent tweet thread. Um, he's exported some assets so we can put those into the video here. Um, so, yeah, let's just go through his points in turn. It's kind of an update to the video that went out last week. 
Um, so first of all, yeah, um, the Series X, uh, some cinematic mode still has frame pacing issues at 30 frames per second. Um, I think this was an issue because the original game didn't have those issues back in the day, um, mm -hmm. which is, which is a problem. Right. Um, the second issue, um, yeah, they're still hitching in the performance mode on the Xbox. So that hasn't been addressed. Uh, as Tom puts it, expects big 80 millisecond plus drops in response. Uh, something that isn't really there on PlayStation 5, curiously, despite its performance actually being lower overall. Um, the performance mode has improved over the 1.0 version. Um, he's noting a five frames per second upgrade there, which means that Series X's performance lead over PlayStation 5 is extended further, stutter notwithstanding. Um, yeah, there's still issues with the 30 FPS mode, which can drop beneath. Mm -hmm. Grass density lowered on performance mode. I mean, that's, that's not good, is it? <laughs> yeah, I, just, I lower the res. I always feel like just lower the res. This feels like know? such a From Software move, where they just it like is. throw in a bunch of new visual stuff and then it runs like garbage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well it is baffling i mean i guess the, the good thing is it is optional so you can not buy it right and you can lean into the back compat enhancements to the original version which essentially unlock the frame rate if i understand that it looks right. great it mm -hmm. to, looks much better seem to be yeah i mean obviously you're lacking a lot of the visual upgrades that were made for spaces choice but are, I, um, I would argue that in many cases they're actually not uh so good no looking. especially things with like it seems like the shadow map stuff was kind of surprising yeah, like the, yeah. the ship in the distance there's no shadow map for some reason so. uh, i also think the screen space shadows are applying incorrectly for foliage yeah, now yeah. and all of looks, tom's looks things bad. i was like oh but there's a lot of screen space shadows on the left but none on the right what's what's that about um so i don't know it seems like a little half-baked in terms of implementation there Another thing there that we never we didn't ever talk about the PC version that launched, but apparently it did have my my good friend Shader Compilation Stutter, uh. according to all the people in our Discord, as well as in the threads I've read online. Yes, I don't have any <laughs> I don't have any transparency about whether or not that has been fixed or on the docket to be fixed. But I do have some good news regarding another game that we should PSA about right now hmm. is that we talked about. Um, Sackboy getting oh, yes. SER yeah. shadier execution also reordering. Known as and Zach Boy in Germany. <laughs> Zach Boy. <laughs> yeah, that that but that sounds like it literally sounds like testicles if you say that in German. Uh, I just want everyone <laughs> yeah, to know that. <laughs> it really does. Um <laughs> But uh, the and DLSS three and the DLSS three was forced on for RTX four thousand users. We've been aware, made aware that the patch has been released which makes DLSS3 optional, as well as my other criti critical point was that, oh, but that means they had to implement Reflex. Well, now Reflex is an option too. For those of you, for example, that want to use Reflex, have lower input latency in this game at whatever uh, mode. Some little caveats in there is that DLSS3 does not work if you're playing multiplayer uh, because their multiplayer is limited to 60 FPS in this game. I think that's probably legacy from like the PlayStation 5, PS4 version of the game. Uh, and then also DLSS3, like it should, turns off frame rate limiting in game as well as VSync, uh, because VSync should be controlled for DLSS3 in the control panel. That is good news. I've also heard that from other people that have played it recently that the most recent patch, when I tried it out, also reintroduced some PSO compilation stutters that weren't there before that were originally eliminated with that patch that fixed them. But I've heard that those are now fixed as well, too. So these are all good things. They've been so responsive. I almost feel bad that they, we almost keep giving them the negative <laughs> news first before we talk about the positive news, but that's how this kind of works. Uh, but now the game is in a much better state oh. uh, for all G people. Al yeah. Allow me to chime in as well uh, on, oh my a, God, on another, another game, PSA. <laughs> uh, Returnal. They fixed the oh, yeah. ultra wide issue that I encountered. Essentially when, good point, when yeah. using a, so I use a 21 by 10 monitor with 3840 by 1600 resolution. And initially with Returnal, it would always draw black bars on the left and right side of the screen, no matter what, like thin black bars, the HUD would draw into that area, but the game screen, the 3D was not rendered out. That is now fixed and it looks fantastic. So that version is even better. It's uh, it's really solid. It's, it's great to see these updates, um, but 
Uh, yeah. And I know game <laughs> development is really hard, right? Yeah, and especially these I, days. I don't envy these guys, but at the same time, it keeps happening. There's a lot of games that are being updated or being, in the case of Spacer's Choice, being shipped with issues that are so staggeringly obvious mm-hmm. that they they shouldn't have shipped. Yeah. And um, you know, let's take Spacer's Choice, for example. The concept of putting out a... Um, an upgrade to a game that actually runs worse than the existing version is basically, um, you know, if I was the producer on that title, I, I, I don't think I could in good conscience put that out. I, uh, secondly, with, you know, it's, it's, it's just baffling, right? Uh, secondly, you know, with the, with the Sackboy DLSS3 update, I mean, the concept of it being mandatorily on. Yeah, that was um, weird. Is, 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 is weirdness and, and it shouldn't have shipped in that state. And just as the way the original release shouldn't have shipped with that horrendous stutter that you literally cannot avoid that, you know, anybody playing the game would have seen. Mm-hmm. And so the concepts that, you know, stuff like this happens and continues to happen when it is literally stuff that you will notice literally immediately yeah. upon yeah, playing. See, I, I have to wonder if they're missing a certain level of subjective analysis where they just sit a human down in front of this thing with this sort of knowledge and play it. Like, could it be that the tools and readouts have become too much of a crutch? Like, okay, well, like if you look at Spacer's Choice, perhaps if you looked at the average frame rate output or something like that, it seems like, okay, that's still within respectable parameters, Right. Or various other issues where it might seem like it's okay if you're just uh, looking at it from the back end. But once you actually sit down and look at it subjectively, you immediately notice the problem and somehow it feels like that's missing, right? Mm-hmm. Like th- there's an instance of a game that, that shipped with an issue where uh, they, I, I won't say what it is, but it was like the game was gold, it was ready to go. It was missing a very specific visual feature or or like a performance feature. And Mm -hmm. they only noticed it because the game's director like sat down with it at home on his own console and was like, hey, what happened to this feature? And you're like, oh, okay, well, we better add that back, right? Like it was just as simple as like the guy just sat down with the final version and happened to notice that this thing was missing. And so they disabled it. And yeah, wow. or or uh, an, an, in a different case, there's like the Dead Space stuff with the uh, VRS, right? <sighs> like computationally, if you look at the back end, you look at the performance numbers like, OK, we're in good shape. But if you subjectively look at the game, you just look at it with your own eyes. You you would think like you would immediately see, OK, there's something wrong here. This does not look correct. Right. And this, this is the kind of stuff we're just seeing happen time and time again. And, you know, I feel for these guys, like you say, Rich, because shipping anything is so difficult and these games have become so complex. But uh, there is that last little bit that seems to be missing constantly. It's. I want to just bring in Resident Evil 4 here really quickly because John's yeah. and uh-huh. Oliver's stuff is going to be out by this time. Mine is not going to be out. Little PSA about that. I don't have the PC version even as I'm talking PSA right now. <laughs> um, so uh, I will. my coverage will be coming later and I'm going to prune it back, I think, a little bit. I'm not going to be as in-depth as usual. I'm going to give out the necessary stuff but not go overboard. Um, there's, there's a demo out there fundamentally. There's a demo. So you have an idea if you want to play that. Yeah. Um, but uh, for that, like... The, the PS5 image quality is one that keeps getting me because if you look at it, the even the layperson reports about the game that I was reading online before I played it was something's wrong with the image on mm-hmm. PlayStation 5. And John <clears throat> pointed out, Oliver pointed out, and I feel like if you're watching the game from a subjective lens, especially since the default settings turn on chromatic aberration anyways, yeah. you're looking at the PlayStation 5 version being like, it doesn't look that much better than the PlayStation 4 version. It, it basically this isn't right. It looks like 1080p to the eye. It, it does. The chromatic aberration runs up pre-checkerboard resolution, apparently, <laughs> which would look like 1080p. Um, so mm, I don't know. Well, that is a curious one. Yeah. You know, assuming parallel development between the consoles, the, the notion that the whatever it is that's causing that problem isn't present or, on both is kind of baffling. Or the control issue on Xbox. How the heck? Yeah. Man, how did they ship that? Like, if you play them back to back, you pick up that controller and the second you touch the right stick, it's immediately evident that, oh, there's something wrong. Right. Mm-hmm. I don't understand how somebody didn't say, oh, we need to adjust this because mm-hmm. uh, it's it's maddening and they have not fixed it yet. 
uh, as of this point. Yeah, well, yeah I think there's a lot there's a lot to unpack there, and uh, uh, we are sort of in danger of maybe yeah. straying into. Uh, <laughs> Rack fortunately old men oh, well, <laughs> complaining we, about it. We everything. are though. That's it's just how it is. Yes, we're <laughs> getting up there in age. This happens inevitably to all men. Well, apart from you, Alex. Yeah, you're, yeah. You're, you're down with the youth. Uh, still a spring <laughs> chicken. With the youth. You know what the youth likes. <laughs> yeah, gosh darn telephones. Uh, yes, they're mobile phones. They're mobile cellular telephones. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, that's that's the end of news for this week, and uh, possibly ranting, but who knows. <laughs> mm. uh, let's move on to the next part of the show, which is supporter Q&A. This is the uh, area of the show where every week we ask our supporters on Patreon to contribute to this show in the form of questions, observations, etc., uh, potential topics and whatnot. Uh, we're going to plough in straight away with a question from Perfect underscore Organism, um, sorry in advance for the wrinkle lines, Alex. I'm presuming uh, it's, 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 reference yeah, he, my age, or I don't know. I don't know. I think he's, I think he's goading you. Anyway, uh, <laughs> given this wonderful free market economy we live in, oh, okay. and with, yeah, <laughs> and with PC being the platform with less of an audience for a lot of cross-platform develop, uh, cross-platform releases, is it reasonable to expect devs to put in the time required to get anything above console settings with a few tweaks slash options? added here or there, given it will generate less less cash than the other ports for the company. Please don't ban me, exclamation point. Uh, interesting question there, Alex, because there is a, um, a question of scalability on PC ports. But at the same time, this notion that they may not make as much money. I mean, when Elden Ring um, shipped, you know, apparently 50% of sales were on PC. Mm-hmm. So it's not a format that I don't, that I think developers deliberately overlook these days in perhaps the same way that they might have done previously. But at the same time, there is this notion here of how much should we expect developers to scale beyond the the console feature set, right? Yeah, this is a hard one because I think it de- depends on developer size. It's hard for me to uh, be upset with an indie smaller developer about lacking PC options versus Ubisoft, um, EA games, etc or Microsoft or Sony ports. So that that's one thing. I think it is a scalable question for depending on who we're talking about. But I think there's an interesting aspect of this that Perfect Organism has maybe overlooked is that development process is iterative. And at some point there's a moving target and there's a target, it's like a stable target in development of what we want the game to graphically look like. And then there's a clawing back and optimization point. You know, we want the game to look like this. We've gotten it visually up to quality. And then now we need to optimize the shader or something like that. And then the quality drops maybe to a certain degree to get a performance. Um, The thing is they had already developed that better looking version of the shader, AKA let's say we're talking about volumetrics and they turned down the volumetric quality there on consoles to keep a performance up. Well, they already had that shader there. Let's ship that on PC as a scalable option. So sometimes they actually make settings already inherently in the development process and whether or not they're exposed is a different question. I mean, Unreal Engine is a classic example, right? Where the PC just has, you know, out of the box, a whole bunch of things that are probably not going to be viable on console. When you look at the ray tracing feature set that's in UE4 or UE5, for example, you know, there's going to be, there's going to be scalability potential there way beyond the consoles and way beyond the hardware capabilities of most PCs out there, to be frank. But, you know, there is still the option to engage those features. Yeah, I hope I hope developers do. Like, I'm hoping with UE5 releases that come out, I don't think many will because it's slightly hitting, but I hope a lot of them, like, allow a tick box to, tick box to not, not only between hardware and software lumen, but hardware lumen has, like, higher levels of quality uh, that scale really nicely and look really good. So I'm hoping developers just don't think, ah, we only need software Lumen because they're shipping out on consoles. Wait, I hope they, they go that extra level. Is it actually true though that PC games always generate less cash than other ports? Because I feel like PC games, especially these days, seem to have very long tails, uh, especially when on marketplaces like Steam, right? People are still buying and playing a lot of classic games many years later. I think maybe it's a, a legacy argument because um, you know there'd be di- like day one cracks for PC games going you know back in the day you know and for whatever reason you know for good or for bad, Denuvo is 
difficult to to crack on day one and that's when all of those sales are going to be happening secondly the concept of multiplayer titles on pc um kind of rules out piracy as well Mm yeah so you know i think it's actually happy days for developers from that perspective in terms of you know people actually paying to play your game so yeah and there was of course the elden ring situation where you know we have the, the sales figures Mm-hmm. You know, fifty percent of all of the all of the Elden Rings sold well on PC, which automatically means more revenue for from software. You'd assume. And wasn't it the case so where, I like, know. I think like Atlas, when they put out Persona games, and some other Japanese studios released like Steam versions of their games, they were all genuinely shocked by just how many copies they sold. And they ended up yeah. doing really well. Like, I feel like the PC audience will reward you if you do them yeah. do them well. The more yeah. niche your game is, almost I feel like it has really good tail like john was talking about like the tail selling like people were getting really um there was a lot of negative news about the selling of like returnal and sackboy mm-hmm. and all these other sackboy. playstation games that weren't sackboy <laughs> uh about like that weren't horizon or spider-man and i'm thinking like well that's you know sometimes people just buy things in sales on steam uh i've been a person that does that so i think the tail end selling on steam is really high for a yeah. lot of niche genre games. They're yeah. good at, at surfacing this stuff in a way mm-hmm. that sometimes the console stores are not. Like you go to like the Nintendo eShop and it's just a nightmare finding anything <laughs> in there. And just like nobody's just browsing it to look for stuff usually because it's just so poorly organized. But with Steam sale stuff and, you know, flash sales and all that, it's always surfaced right on the front page. It's very easy to see it there. Get Getting that visibility. And I think that probably does pretty well for a lot of PC games. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, to go back to Perfect Underscore Organism's point here, I'm just thinking about Elden Ring again. And it did. It was a massive, gigantic hit on PC. And um, yeah, there wasn't actually much love for the PC user in that port at all. And, you know, 60 FPS limits, um, ultra wide issues, all, stuttering, you know, stuttering uh, at launch, and it's still not great. Yeah, I mean, that that is not good. But uh, I think on in general terms, things are sort of better for PC. Anyway, um, let's move on to the next question. This one from Gorguts uh, with a Z. Uh, I'll, take, I'll tackle this one. It's quite quick. Uh, what do you think about the rumor of the Switch successor using Samsung 5 nanometer? Is it a forward port of NVIDIA's Ampere architecture or a back port of Lovelace or something completely new? Um, what we know about the Switch SoC, and it's none of it is confirmed, but it does look to be like a next generation Tegra based on the Ampere architecture. Um, that would make the concept of it running on Samsung's 8 nanometer process more of a, uh, a conventional fit because that architecture was designed for that process. But at the same time, there is precedence, of course, with uh, Tegra X1, which was on um, a different process and was a more advanced form of the Maxwell architecture. Uh, a lot of features from Pascal made their way into the Tegra X1. Mm. Is that going to be the case for Switch 2? We just don't know. Is it going to use Samsung 5 nanometer? Possibly, uh, but the question there is really, you know, just remember, and we, I'm going to say this every time the Switch 2 is announced and or rumored about, um, state-of-the-art technology isn't, isn't Nintendo's game. They'd be more interested, I think, in a cost reduction. So whether that happens or not, I just don't know. Um, I would be not surprised to see a backport of some features from Lovelace to uh, to whatever this chip is using. Mm-hmm. I think it would be amazing if the optical flow analyzer used for DLSS three was oh my God. was part of good. that backport. That... But this is this is like massive wishful thinking. I know, part. but it would make so much sense for Nintendo. I feel like it <laughs> it's, it fits exactly what those their machines are about right being able to generate i think the question is you know it's it's like when we go back to alex's um feasibility test of how dlss2 would work on um a lower power ampere uh chip um it's the surrounding stuff i guess i mean let's assume there is a fixed cost on the optical flow analyzer there's still a lot more happening uh Mm -hmm. with dlss3 than just the optical flow analyzer but uh, yeah, I guess we'll have to wait and see. We'll have to wait. Let's, let's just crack on with the next question. This one from Abba Dabba <laughs> Pling Boink We. Yes. <laughs> um, do you think the AI revolution that we just entered and the subsequent data center GPU demand will kill any hope for declining desktop GPU prices in the next couple of years? 
AI is the big thing at the moment, isn't it, Alex? I mean, what do you think about this? Um, so this is uh, this is a hard question because the desktop GPUs are not going to be the GPUs in the data centers, but rather they'll be part of the the large uh, order from NVIDIA, from TSMC, and they'll maybe take up a larger portion of that order than the than the consumer GPUs, which would then create a price competition for consumer GPUs, I guess, uh, because there'd be less of them. Maybe that's the thing that happens. Uh, <laughs> God, this is such a theoretical question. I don't know if I can even answer it right. Um, well, I think uh, the the bottom line is that the reason desktop GPU prices are rising, um, one of the key reasons is that the wafers are so expensive, right? Mm -hmm. That wafer cost doesn't look as though it's going to be going down. No. When we move to the next process, it's actually going up, not to the same extent as the leap from seven to five nanometer or four nanometer or whatever. But, you know, it is an issue. It's it's the fact that the wafers are so expensive and the R&D costs are staggering. They should, so, they should just use yeah. vanilla wafers, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, right. <laughs> Delicious vanilla wafers. <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, I, I don't think there'll be as, mu as much of a value issue on the next generation because the cost of um, the, I think it's the three nanometer wafers, doesn't seem to be as much of a huge leap as it was in the last ones. But again, it's just guesswork at this point, really. Let's move on to the next question. This one from, well, how do you pronounce this? Go Choma? Oh Got my Koma. goodness. Who knows? Um, Hi, DF crew. Following the rumors of the PS5 Pro, do you think it's possible that it comes with the ML dedicated hardware AMD is developing or would it be too soon? And in the same topic, now that NVIDIA has announced uh, CU Litho will consumer hardware start improving much faster not specifically thanks to that since it will mostly impact manufacturing from what I've seen but to other tools. Um, uh, I, I missed the discussion last week on the PS5 Pro, but I assumed that you weren't receptive to the idea. We were not. <laughs> we were not receptive. No. <laughs> I mean, I mean, there was a thing on GDC this week where Microsoft had a display of all of its Xboxes, and there was kind of like a, a progression of Xboxes every three years or so, except on seventh gen where 360 was uh, was was kind of around for a long, long time. Um, this is a really interesting point because I don't think there is much to gain from moving to a PS5 from a uh, Pro mm -hmm. from a PS5 simply by virtue of the fact that transistor costs are sky high at the moment. But at the same time, machine learning silicon would make a difference. Here's the thing, right? Back in the day, we were talking about how a, con um, a machine could be made that would leverage machine learning um, because we looked at DLSS2 and obviously there were big gains there, right? And obviously now there's DLSS3 doing similar things. Um, but at the same time, now we've got FSR2, which doesn't require machine learning dedicated hardware. Does that nullify the idea that it should have machine learning hardware? Hmm. Alex? Not for Pro, but for PS6, I hope it does. Um, right. Because... There's other application points that we talked about last week. And it was John's end. It was like John's last point after we were just saying like PS5 Pro, there's a lot of reasons why we don't think it's feasible. And then also we were saying like, what's the selling point? What's the interesting thing about this? Like yes. it was like, we just couldn't come up with anything that was like, you can play your RT mode at 60 FPS. And I was like, maybe is the hardware even capable of that? I don't know. But then at the very end was John, like John was like, oh yeah, but what about, what if they added in something so they they could have FSR three on there, frame generation yeah, on there? And I was right. like, and I was like, actually, that is a more compelling idea for a pro, and it's more like an Xbox One S at that point, where it has it's like the same hardware but a little bit better in one aspect, but it's kind of more transformative. It would be way more that, transformative. I think it is more transformative. Uh, so maybe that is the, actually the interesting route for PS five Pro or PS six is changing the paradigm of rendering maybe mm, okay yeah i do kind of like the idea that a mid-generation refresh would be something like an xbox one s where it's you know essentially features that are nice to have but uh may not transform the console you know it would it would be more of an iterative upgrade and um the one s was a, a much better machine than the one you know you know all manner of dimensions you know form factor um media feature set uh, HDR support, 
I think it did that. But yeah, the the, the vectors of um, game changing features that you could deliver uh, at 2024 is is quite limited. Might be quite an interesting exercise to actually see what could be done based on AMD's roadmaps. CPU wise, I think they they're in really good shape because the CPU, you know, as it turns out, the CPUs in the current gen consoles are actually, while vastly superior to last gen, they've been outstripped by the latest advances um in the pc space you know I'd, I'd be really interested to get some head-to-head data on that um but yeah i don't know uh <laughs> machine learning silicon it's going to depend really yeah let's see what happens in the pc space we've seen dlss2 we've seen dlss3 but we've not seen much beyond that yet it was quite interesting to note that um uh ps5 actually had with returnal audio features that tapped into hardware accelerated rate raising which was interesting and that did make its way to pc i don't know i don't think machine learning is is game changing in the here and now but who knows in the here and now uh, in the here and now quote unquote ting, ting. <laughs> uh, next question this one from 1040 sdf hi dft many games have released on psvr2 since it launched despite the obvious ones you already covered do you have any recommendations has anyone in the team played switchback vr it looks fantastic as it's the spiritual successor to one of the best psvr1 games even if it seems if there were some launch tech issues john you said you were expecting fantavision vr did you play it is it any good we've not played it have we no I, I still need to check out fantavision uh i am curious about that one uh, I was, I guess, uh, other stuff that I have played in the meantime, though. So I am actually interested in Switchback VR, and I was planning to buy it initially, but then I was kind of turned off by some of the tech issues and the fact that it's, uh, yeah. But so things I could recommend. First of all, they just put up a demo for C Smash VR, which is sort of a new VR take on Cosmic Smash for the Sega Dreamcast, which is a fantastic. Mm kind of game uh and it feels really great in vr you're basically moving back and forth with the stick although you can move in room scale and you hold the racket with your hand using the the sense controller and it just it feels very satisfying to hit that ball and just the whole presentation the clarity of everything it was extremely immersive and it's i was actually getting like chills from playing it which is a weird thing, but I was like, wow, this is just like, I don't know. There's, there was just something about the way it felt in the presentation that really uh, pulled me in. So I'm really happy about that. Uh, secondly, <clears throat> I actually reinstalled after so many years, no man's sky. Uh, and I really like what I've seen so far in that, in VR, in that game for a couple of reasons. First of all, this was actually available in PSVR one already but due to the limitations of the ps4 the image quality is about as bad as you could have ever imagined it was so (laughs) blurry that it basically looked as if you were just like looking at some kind of like mosaic painting that was like very abstract it's like okay i kind of recognize this but it's It's a heavy game right? it's a heavy game right doing that in vr is not easy and the ps4 just wasn't up for it uh with psvr2 you know it's not perfect but there's a significant boost in clarity. It's a much sharper looking game. Still not as sharp as I'd like, but it's light years beyond PSVR 1. <laughs> uh, and the hand controllers just add a lot to it. The whole new interface, it's almost like an augmented reality style thing where you're, That's you're cool. projecting, like you'll, you'll like look at your, your left wrist and it shows like a projected hologram of your various options available in your inventory. And you use your other hand, it's literally like tap on the buttons uh, virtually with your hands and it all just kind of feels uh, really immersive uh, in a way kind of like the minority report stuff that we've always kind of wanted to see Ooh, right that was a deep cut john i but, haven't heard that in a while yeah, right? <laughs> but the the main thing that that no man's sky has going on is just like i always used to think like what's the point of exploring procedural planets there's nothing interesting here right uh but doing it in vr the, the sense of scale that it creates and the, the atmosphere actually makes just walking around those planets like somehow super immersive in a way that surprised me. Like when you walk up a hill, it feels huge. Like you're like, whoa, that's a really steep hill. And just when it goes nighttime, uh, just the, the atmospheric impact of the time of day change is significant. And even things like climbing into your spacecraft and utilizing the very inst- various instrument panels, 
uh, for instance, when you fly, rather than just like using the, the, the stick on your sense controller, you literally use your virtual hand to grab the, the cockpit joystick and throttle. And you're, you're moving your hands as if you're holding a joystick rather than just like using the stick on the PSVR controllers. Uh, so the whole thing just like really works well. Um, I played it with all the safety stuff turned off. So I got rid of the blinders. Uh, I disabled teleportation, which is an option and it's used by default, all of the stuff. And it feels pretty amazing. I think the only thing that could cause motion sickness for people maybe is the jetpack. Like you, if you remember no man's sky, you use the jetpack and you continue to accelerate and, and move vertically until you run out of fuel or the charge and you instantly start to fall down. And that, that is a uh, pretty intense, you'll feel your stomach come up through your throat there. <laughs> oh my goodness. Jump off a huge cliff jetpack. And then it's like, Oh no, or you, you fall down to the, to the ground. It's a, uh, <laughs> it's something. Yeah. Transfer vision. That's Sony game. I don't think they sampled it, which is interesting. Yeah. I'm curious. Mm. There wasn't much said. I actually almost kind of forgot about that. And I, I shouldn't because I really like Fantavision vision on PS2. Yeah, I loved it. On and PS2, I think that yeah. team is the one that went on to make flip Nick ultimate pinball. Uh, so, which is another amazing PS2 game. So yeah, I need to check that out. I, I am waiting for more stuff on PSVR. I saw that like before your eyes or whatever it's called. Mm-hmm. I think it's out. I need to double check actually, but I, I swear I saw it for sale. Uh, that's the one where you sort of like go back through the life of a, a person who's dying. And every time you blink your eyes, it like apparently moves forward through time which sounds really interesting conceptually, but also a little bit too heavy for my uh, state of <laughs> mind at the moment. So I may resist checking it out for the moment. <laughs> we'll see. Fair enough. Uh, let's let's uh, round off with a final question from Bjork Tribe. So this would be your two year birthday. Yes, actually, no. Uh, even though episode 100 is in the bag now, just four episodes later, what have you learned about yourself? Uh, just about the two year birthday thing. We do 51 episodes a year. So two year birthday would have been 102 i guess yeah mm-hmm. that's true. um but uh, well what have you learned about yourselves uh, alex oh my goodness um <laughs> i've learned probably through in terms of df direct related things is that a little bit of uh preparation will help to um spice up the direct in terms of getting recordings of games or testing out things i like the fact that we just did a psa and weren't just talking about uh, like the news items. I think it's fun when we can do mini reports on games. I enjoy that actually. So I've yeah. learned that about myself. Mm. John, <laughs> what I've learned is I love my friends and colleagues at DF, and uh, it's, I, oh. I love talking to you guys and everybody on the team. Since we all work remotely, it's a great chance to sort of come together and just talk about the stuff that we've been looking at and playing that week, and just news in mm-hmm. general. So it's it's fun. So that- yeah, I think uh, I, I raised this point in the 100 discussion, but you know the concept of doing this show was actually quite terrifying to begin with because we're misquoted and misrepresented so many times that when we actually come to scripting a piece of work, a lot of thought goes into, um, to put it frankly, not being misrepresented by the more lunatic fringe. It's, it's very <laughs> stressful. Inhabit. <laughs> particularly inhabit Twitter. So the concept of doing a completely unscripted, not a live show, but as good as, is actually quite terrifying. But we've, we've kind of somehow made it made it work. And uh, yeah, something that Alex pointed out there, when we initially started this, we thought we could just sort of sit down and just sort of jabber for an hour, an hour and a half. But it actually turns out that producing DF Direct Weekly the original concept was that it'd be quite a cheap show to produce in terms of resources invested into it, but you do need to prepare and you do need to, you know, have a flow for the show put together, which I've spent quite a lot of time thinking about the day before. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, but one thing which definitely makes it a lot easier is um, the supporter input, uh, which really does elevate the show and it, and they enables us to get a few more viewpoints in there. And we try and get those questions in, not just in the Q&A section, but also in the news as well. So, yeah, that's kind of what I've learned about this procedure in terms of what I've learned about myself. It is just basically, you know, the concept that we can actually do this show at all, unscripted. Mm-hmm. And it still seems to be vaguely compelling to about 100,000 people every week, which I think is just fantastic. That's awesome. 
<laughs> uh, but that's it. I think it's the end of the show. Uh, DF Direct Weekly 104, uh, aka Daddy's Back. <laughs> he's, he's a, <laughs> yeah, he's that's a wrap. Be there. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, if you enjoyed it, please do like, subscribe, share, ring the bell for those notionally instant notifications. Um, actually, it's not notional. It, it, was, it, it continues is to be very real. As you know. Because, <laughs> yeah. You know. Who did that? I I don't know. I, I don't. Who's, I don't think it was me. I don't remember doing that. I don't recall doing it. Okay, fair Unless enough. it was an accident. Um, I don't know. <laughs> one of the supporter questions was, "What is the channel?" And I, and I, I don't think it's fair to actually point out who uh, who or what it is. But <laughs> it's, it's become a running but, gag at this point. It is a running <laughs> gag, yes. Um, but yeah, something else to point out as well is that uh, an audio version of DF Direct Weekly is available on your favorite podcasting uh, supplier. So yeah, if you just want to listen, that's an option too. Uh, but that's all from us for this week. We'll be back next week with uh, 905, I guess. But that's all from us for now. Thanks for watching. <laughs> <laughs>